The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room that's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another episode of the Engine Room podcast. I'm here today with a gentleman who I've just worked out literally five minutes ago, we were born at the same hospital, St. George Hospital in Sydney. Um, He then promptly asked, do I go for the St. George Dragons? In which uh, I responded with, no, I go for the Canary Banks 10 Bulldogs. Um, He threatened to walk out. Um, But thankfully, after a lot of kowtowing, a lot of sucking up to him, I've managed to get Mark Chan, founder of Avondale Wealth Management, to sit down and regale us for an engine room. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Roxy. And jokes aside, um, it, it is a very small world. And um, uh, you you mentioned that you're a, you're you, you born in in the um, St George district. Uh, you went to school there, university in Sydney. But I suppose what a lot of our listeners like to hear, because you've got a successful business, you've been running that business for 21 years, is what drove you to get into financial planning in the late 90s, early noughties from memory, and, and kind of what were a couple of the people who helped you out or a couple of learnings that you had? I think I really stumbled into financial planning. It was purely accidental. I was one of those rare 17-year-olds that just had it all together and I knew what I wanted to do. And back then, what really appealed to me was a glitz and glamour of being in a, the hotel industry, being the service industry, working in a five-star hotel, maybe even a fine dining restaurant. And I took it upon myself to actually door knock on the cafes and restaurants in Brighton La Sands in Sydney South, where I grew up, and face rejection upon rejection until- Were you wearing a, a pretty snappy suit like you are today? <laughs> uh, to, today I am, but back in the day with just um, a pimply face, 17-year-old, it probably wasn't too attractive. Uh, But thankfully, one restaurant uh, invited me in and I said I was happy to work for free. And they asked me what I can do. So just to get the foot in the door, I said I can wash dishes. And that's what I did with them for five years. (laughs) And and look at- Sorry, did- um, we, we might have some people from the Modern Slavery Act here. At any stage, did they pay you in those five years? Eventually, that, <laughs> eventually they did, but they paid me primarily in food, which I was more than happy with that right, exchange. Right, right. Um, but look, it, it, it sort of whet that appetite for me. And even going to university, I studied commerce, but I majored in, in marketing and hospitality management. And through that course, through the experience and what I studied, um, through working that Chinese restaurant for a few years, it did eventually open the doors for me to work in one of Sydney's five-star establishments. And um, look, I, I, I went on uh, to eventually graduate, um, having worked in, in that environment in hospitality. And I managed to secure a very coveted role post-university to work in an international five-star hotel chain. Beautiful. So, six months working overseas in a different country at a time. You live- What was your favorite country? What was your favorite country? Well, it gets better. Okay. After securing that offer, my parents said, well, you're not going. Right. So, mum and dad said, we thought that this whole 
five star hotel business, you would outgrow it. <laughs> and and being the compliant Asian son that I am, I said, "You're you're right. What is what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> it's not for me after all." My mum at the time was working at the Commonwealth Bank, and she was a teller. Yep, and she said, "Mark, you should work in the bank. It's a it's a job for life. That's what you need. You need the stability." of a job in a bank. And that's what I did. I applied for a role. And because I had a marketing background, I ticked the box on the Commonwealth Bank's graduation form and it said, brand management. Rocked up for the meeting and the area manager there, um, by the name of Tony Hatch, and he changed my life. He said, Mark, why do you want to be a branch manager? And I was taken aback. Branch manager is not what I signed up for. I, I'm, thought, I'm thinking this is brand management. So he spent half an hour telling me, well, you know what? There's other roles that we can possibly open up and, and consider you for. And in financial services of the Commonwealth Bank, we have a role where we can train you to be an investment consultant. Sounds flash. Yeah. And look, I, he was very gracious. He spent half an hour telling me what an investment consultant does. And I said, look, you know what? I'll put my hand up. I think I'll be interested in that. So fast forward, I worked at the Commonwealth Bank as a salaried employee. So what for, year was that, Mark? Um, that was 2001. Yep. So I worked at the Commonwealth Bank as a salaried employee with them for nine years. And nine years into it, I got a tap on the shoulder to say, look, we want to keep the senior advisors in the Commonwealth Bank. We want to give you an opportunity to be self-employed. So they were self-employed through the Commonwealth Bank, still working under their brand, yep. but giving us autonomy to run our own business, have our own P&Ls. And I did that for a further 10 years until the Royal Commission happened and the bank said, look, we're cutting you guys loose. We don't want to be in the game anymore. And they closed down their wealth management business. So what year, would, what year did they formally close it down? Um, that was 2019. Right. So not quite a job for life, but, but it, was a, it was a few years anyway. Well, well, 19 years all in all, I thought I had a wow. pretty good stint with the Commonwealth Bank. Okay. Okay. And what, what area, like what, what town and what city were you in, were you looking after? I was working in Parramatta, so the western suburbs of Sydney. Yeah. So almost all of those 19 years were in the same location in Parramatta, building my business. And over that time, you would have developed pretty good relationships with you know small and medium-sized business owners who would have you know, used a bunch of services. Is that kind of driven you into the type of clients that you have now? Look, I'll say that primarily our clientele is is probably your your traditional mum and dads. Right. So what we what we love, who we love working with are clients who are five to ten years out from retirement, where we're putting together a plan, but we also have the benefit um clients that some of our clients we've dealt with for, for 15, 20 years, where we can now see the fruits of their labor, fruits of their sacrifice when they started working with us, um, they're now really enjoying their retirements. And we get a lot of satisfaction from that. And can I ask you some specifics around the the whatever the, the exit, the bank exit of from from fight because it wasn't just Commonwealth Bank, it was all banks, right? Yeah, that's right. So at what stage do you think it was on the cards? Because you would have had a bunch of colleagues you'd worked with for years. And what was the chatter amongst all of you? Were you all excited about the opportunity? Was there fear? Like was well, what was I would love to just get a bit of a feel for it because I know significant numbers of great financial planning practices in twenty twenty four who did go through that experience. Yeah, yeah. So Look, for me, I felt that after 19 years, being in the same organization, knowing their policies, their procedures, the people really intimately, it was, it was daunting. Like I was, yeah. I was institutionalized. And, and for me, leaving Commonwealth Bank, I, I had some self-doubt. Like to, that self-doubt probably drove me to having conversations with private equity group, groups to possibly look at partnering with them to help me to grow my business in that next phase. Um, even though I knew that I was successful in what I was doing, I was profitable in my business, but the real moment of awakening for me is in, when these private equity groups, when they did the deep, deep dive into my business, they really said that I'm a sole practitioner. It's a lot of key, key person risk. Um, I'm probably... Uh, like a very well remunerated, glorified employee, and you take me out of the business, there is no business. So the valuation that I thought 
I, I would be looking at what was actually not there. So that was the catalyst for me to really work hard on growing out my business over the last five years. And and we spoke off air earlier about how you've built your engine room effectively, as you mm. called it. Now, um, from a from a personal perspective, you've got yourself, you've got three teenage daughters. Um, so you went from this very, as you planned it, uh, a highly paid, glorified employee back being a highly paid person and to jumping into being your own boss, what was the conversation with, with your partner and family about, you know, how did you sit down and, I suppose, sell the most important people in your life this vision? I think my wife is very trusting um, and she's very supportive and she's always encouraged me and, and pushed me to, to to try things out. And look, having said that, I was already – self-employed for 10 years. So yep. for me, it wasn't new. It was just moving away Security from something blanket. I knew. Yep. That's right. Yep, yep. No worries. And um, when you did end up moving, um, you found yourself now um, in, in an organization, a licensee. Um, we'll come back to that in a, a later in depth of how the licensee works if you, but how did you end up picking? Like, because you, you could have gone many places. A lot of people would have taken you know, a well-qualified, well-credentialed, experienced person with existing clients, what were you looking in a business partner? We probably sat down with at least 15 different licensees at the time. This is back in 2019 where there were a plenty. And really, I think that their offering was very similar, but I was very particular in choosing a licensee because, frankly, I think license the, the traditional licensee services are dead where they would just offer you the ability to work under a license and clip the tickets and offer no more than that. What I was really looking for is a licensee that would probably do three main things for me. One is to keep me safe, keep my team safe. Um, two, I, w- I was looking for a licensee that will help us to be more profitable than where we are today. And three, teach me how to be more efficient. Yep. So- you were very much after the the growth story and putting that infrastructure in place. And I imagine the wake-up call of when you realized that you didn't have a business, you had a great job. Mm. And then how long, you know, you're, you're far from old, but you're also not young. You're in that, I think it's called middle, right? So, and you're looking at what legacy can you leave financially for yourself and your family and all the rest of it. I mean, you had to get your skates on. So, I suppose- Talking of skates, let's talk about now, after five years of, of, of reviewing that, that's quite a lot of months, I think, um, what does it look like now? You know, what's the, the practice look like? What's, um, how many uh, ARs do you have and, and um, what's the org structure? Yeah, so at the moment, we've got two advisors in my team. So Chris- Does that, does that include you? It includes me. Yep. So Chris and myself. Yep. Uh, so Chris was previously on our professional year program, so he subsequently graduated from that and now what one of our our, our key advisors. Uh, we also have another graduate, Matthew, who's recently joined our team that we're looking at putting him through his studies and eventually through the professional year program as well. Uh, we have Adelaide who's looking after our administration and our power planning team, so she's really all things. Um, she's she's our practice manager, but she makes sure that everything functions. And did you, because Adelaide's ex-CBA, is that right? Or? That's right. So I worked with Adelaide when I first started the Commonwealth Bank more than 20 right. years ago. Okay. So she was my servicing advisor back in the day. Yep. Um, and when- So was it a Jerry Maguire moment? Who's with me? Uh, when you uh, <laughs> <laughs> And she's like, I guess I am. <laughs> yeah. yeah, look, we, we probably found ourselves back together- uh, possibly around um, 2019 when the Commonwealth Bank closed down their, their offering and all of a sudden she was out of a job and it was just our good fortune to be able to take some of her wealth of knowledge to introduce her back into our team. So we're, we're very lucky, very blessed. Perfect, perfect. And um, the the actual business uh, that, he, uh, that stands today – um, what are the types? I mean, so you mentioned the types of clients, as you say, mums and dads. But I think you're quite a modest person. Um, what what are the services that you typically provide to to these these clients? Because you've got a you've got a few other feathers in your cap, correct? 
Yeah, yeah, we do. So we we also have a mortgage broking side of our business. So we do have um, the 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 lending side, the finance side taken care of. We certainly like to protect our clients well through insurance. So we do a little bit of that. But the bread and butter for us is around the whole retirement planning strategy. Are they on track? What does retirement look like for them? Um, do we need to pivot? Do we need to change things up? Do we need to um, address what their their retirement might look like if they made no changes compared to what we can do in working with them to create create that plan, to create that journey for them. And I'll go off piece for a moment. Um, you operate in Parramatta. It's the centre of Sydney. Sydney is one of the most expensive places in the country, in the world, to, to buy property. Increasingly, do you find that, that those clients in their 50s are needing to provide even debt assistance to their children? And so is it kind of... In the old days, it was very much uh, once you turn 50, you don't really need mortgages in, in your life. But these days, potentially, do you find that with your clients? Yeah, look, I, I find that there's there's a lot of family assistance that happens. And oftentimes, that will alter the financial plan that we put in place for the client. So we're always revisiting, always repositioning and taking to client, uh, into account clients' new objectives. And I would be absolutely remiss of me, and we'll include a link, because this is about the best-looking office that I've seen for a long time. Um, explain to me the office that you've got and when you bought it, and it's a beautiful building. What's the history there? We're very fortunate. So the name of the building is actually called Avondale House. Okay. So it's- the- What a coincidence. <laughs> Same as your company name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very creative. So we've, we've borrowed on that name. And we've created Avondale Wealth. Um, so it's, it's steeped in history. It's been around since the late 1800s. Wow. And it will be long standing after I'm gone. So we're only the temporary custodians. We're very, very fortunate to have that. It's a two-story heritage house, eight rooms, um, grand entrance, high ceilings. It's, yeah, it's a fantastic place to work. Yeah. And it, look, I think um, uh, it also uh, provides a sense of occasion for clients to come in. And, and do many clients visit the office? Most of our clients do. So I would say I that- I can see why when I look yeah. at the site, right? Yeah. So, um, and how, how many, um, so how many clients, you've got two ARs at the moment, mm. and we spoke earlier, and we're, we're going to talk about sort of what's on your wish list for the future towards the end of the podcast. Um, how many family units do you guys manage um, in total? Yeah, it's about 270 family units between Chris and myself. Um, so we- And do you, do, you, do you arrange yourself in vertical pods or do you sort of, is it all pooled? Yeah, it's, it's all pooled. So we, our staff get involved in dealing with all, all of our clients. So that's probably one of the selling points that I find that we have is that when clients come in to deal with Avondale Wealth, they're really dealing with all of us. So we want to create- that experience for the clients where they walk into the office and our staff know them by name. They know how they like their coffee. They, we, they, they know, we know their history. We know um, their health situation. We know their family situation. And for us, it's, it's, a, it's a family office, but it's, the aim is really to create exceptional experiences for the client as soon as they walk through the door. I'm a bit older than you, but I used to watch a show called Cheers. And uh, it was the bar where everyone knew your name, and it's a, it was quite a quote. Can we add? Can we add the uh, the soundtrack to Kieran, the sound guy? That's it. Just we're now getting quite self indulgent, but uh, it, it does feel comforting when not just the advisor, but the a whole team, you know, can introduce themselves to the couple. It makes them feel um, like that. Yeah, I mean, it gives them peace of mind, doesn't it? I, I agree because there's there's that age I was saying that. People tend to forget what we say, what we do, but they never forget how we make them feel. Yeah, that's right. So for for us, that's a really important component of why they're clients of Avondale. Yeah, and and that that selling that peace of mind. Now, um, do you uh, so you know in a world that's post COVID, are all of your team in your office? Do you have any outside contractors? Maybe get us a bit of a feel for um, you know uh, the way in which it, it works with your people. Yeah, yeah, we do. Look, we've got. We're very well supported by our admin team. They're, they're outsourced. They're based in Cebu in the Philippines, and we shout just, out to the Cebu locals. Yeah, we well, and and look, they're the best in the business. Five Elk. Yep. 
um, and our staff there, Steffi and Jewel, uh, we, we love dealing with them. And in fact, we're, we're so grateful that they've chosen to work for us because these girls wake up at 4.30 in the morning and then it takes them an hour to get into the office and they get into the office at 6 a.m. just in time for our morning huddle at 9 a.m. Well, there's a couple Australian of Sydney time. It's nine a.m. our time, but it's six o'clock Cebu time. Well, that's right. Well, that but then at some, uh, they also then get uh, an early mark at four o'clock though, so they can go and do their uh, uh, their after hours activities, which is good fun. So. They they do, but let me tell you, at six o'clock their time, they're the bubbliest, most energetic people you ever find. So that really creates that mood for us in our office as well. We're going to come back to the uh, word you said that about daily huddles. Um, but while I've got you on the, the the running a global team, what are the what are the two to three um, uh, sort of tips you would give other uh, other um, practice managers and practice owners about running a global team? I think running global team is difficult because of the distance, but you need to bridge that gap. And the way that we do that is they're they're an employee of our business of Avondale Wealth. Yeah. The way that we treat them, the way that we reward them. Um, so how do you reward them? Um, so, extra stuff? Yeah. So it could be um, quarterly bonuses. It yeah. could be um, even on every Friday, we shout them breakfast in the office. Yep. Um, so that's just a little little surprise and delight things from time to time. End the financial year, Christmases, uh, we give the meal vouchers for them to go out as a team. Um, and also, I'll be visiting them in November. Because we we is this is this an announcement to them or like will this be the first? No, they know. Oh, okay, they know. They know. So we're going to be paying them a visit and inviting Steffi, one of our key staff in the Philippines, to come and join us in Sydney in January next year. So well, that means a lot, not just to them, but to their families. It, it does. It's, it's all about status. It's about the the level of uh, of of career that their child has. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, you've given me more than two to three. So, thanks yeah. very much. And it's much. a business without borders because we don't want there to be. Yeah. There's a time difference already, but we yeah. don't want to see that it's us and them. It's it's one whole team, and we want to show that we, we value them, and we're really grateful for for them choosing to work with us. And I doubt you could look after 270 families with without them. Impossible. So, um, a big shout out to Daniela as well in Five Elk. So, what's your new business aspiration per year? Look, for us, we we want to grow consistently and sustainably. So, we don't want to blow up the back office, which is the reason why the last four or five years, new business hasn't been the main focus for us. The focus has been on laying the solid foundation, so brick by brick, um, making sure that our back office works, our tech stack works, our software is integrated. So, from a client's experience they're seeing that things are just smooth. So that's really important for us to build. So it hasn't really been on the new business over the last few years, but we're now at that point that it has to be. So we know that the back office is humming smoothly, humming well. Um, We now can have the capacity to see more clients knowing that their experience will be top notch. So you touched on then about, you sounded very proud about how you've um, created a client experience with uh, technology. So, what what is your your tech stack, and 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 maybe how does that integrate into the the, the client I- experience? Yeah, so we we're using X Plan uh, for our CRM, but we're also using Zeppo just to track through our workflow. And Zeppo has been a real game changer. When you have a global team, you want to have the visibility of of what people are working on. We want to help them to reprioritize, and for us. Uh, as leaders in the business, it's also working out where the bottlenecks are. So is there too much pressure on a particular point? Do we need to throw more resources? Do we need to add more assistance? Um, do we need to change that structure so that we're not overloading one person? So it's giving us the full visibility of our business and our workflow. So that's been very helpful. And what junctures, as the CEO of the business, principal CEO, how do you use- those bottlenecks get escalated to you. Do you have a formal sort of process for that, or is it? Do you are you hands on? How do you know if there's bottlenecks personally? Look, we we tend to know as a team. So as a team, we do have have monthly meetings where we try to work out where areas that we can improve, what's not working, what is working, 
um, and how people are feeling. So we want to make sure that we're not overwhelming any one individual. Um, but in our team, what's been great is the culture that we've built where where we see that one person's overwhelmed or have a little bit more for that week, everybody kicks in, everybody helps out. And uh, we've, we've really seen that come to the fore. Well, that's a positive and open communication um, uh, lubricates the, the problem solving. Um, with the, uh, do you have any other technology for client facing? We we use My Prosperity. Yep. Um, so that's part of the tech stack through our licensee, and and it's all integrated through Xplan as well. But it's our client portal, and and that's what the clients see. They see all of their investments in the one place instead of needing to log into different systems. It's all captured on the one place. Yep. Uh, we also use that for um, uploading secure and sensitive client information, digital signatures. It's all done through that client portal. Which apart from being really nice as a, a UX experience for the client, it actually is almost non-negotiable from a cybersecurity these days. So, um, no, well done. Um, on that, let's go back to um, your licensee. So, um, you mentioned earlier, so you, you went out and you licensed by Fortnum. Yes. Yeah, they have historically had a pretty good, pretty good lineage in in investments. So, um, do, how do you run your your practice's investments? Do you have a an SMA or what are the sort of platforms that, that you've historically utilised? Yeah, primarily we're using managed accounts. Yep. So for us, we think that we're more um, strategy advisors. We're not necessarily going to be um, stock picking or choosing fund managers and yep. and blending them together. So we leave that to the research team that Fortnum have, um, but also we work with a number of managed account providers, providers in particular your, your Innovas. Yeah, okay, great. And um, and in relation to, you mentioned you did some life insurance. Yeah. Is there, um, like, of the advisors, do you have a, a specialist or do you each of you do a little bit of it? We do a little bit of it. It's It's probably not the biggest focus in our business, but we are a holistic advice practice. So we know that it's part and parcel of um, wealth accumulators that have got debts we need to protect it. So I wouldn't say that's been a really big focus for what we do. But it's something that I suppose, as you say, it's, it's the right thing to do for the client. Absolutely. So, um, it does that. Now, um, with the actual business it, itself, um, you've got, you mentioned uh, when I asked the question about your new business, you, you you kind of reversed and said, no, no, we haven't been focusing on that going backwards. We've built this capacity. But off air, before we started, you kind of said, we're ready to go, Roxy. You know, like if, if anyone's listening to this and, and wants to get a feeling for, are we, uh, are we a place to, to work with? You've spent all these years building out this process. You've you spent all the years doing that. So as as the the visionary, um, what what are your aspirations the next one or two years for for new clients? And and is there any new client direction you'd like to go in? Yeah, look, absolutely. I think that uh, with the investment in the systems and recruiting the right people, we're we're now in that next growth phase and. One of the ways that we want to grow is really focusing on the front office and having the distribution, looking at at um, new entrants into our industry in professional years and taking them through that journey. I think how hard is that? Sorry to interrupt, but yeah. you just did that with Chris McRae, right? Yeah. Um, how many worked with you? No. Um, Chris has worked with me for about three and a half years. Okay. So you, you, as you, you've spent three and a half years. Um, he's obviously worked out, but it's a lot of time and effort to invest if someone doesn't work out. So what did you think you did to end up with the result you've got with Chris? I think we have to share with them the vision that we see for them in our business. And that's really important that they know how they're tracking and what we're promising to do. So when Chris started off with us, we told him that He's going to be working really hard. He'll be learning in two years what will normally take somebody five years to learn. But and we're going to push that, it. You think? Why, why do you? Why do you? How can? How can you be confident to make that claim? Because we know how what's involved. We know what his goals are. He wants to be an advisor. Yep. And most people to get a really good understanding of what advisors do, not just sitting in front of the client, but the whole back office that you're also responsible for. It takes time. It takes a lot of time. So we wanted to give him that exposure. We wanted to let him know that we've got a very solid plan for him. 
you're going to do your studies and you're going to complete it in, in one and a half years. So that's a deployment financial planning. After that, you're going to shadow an advisor. You're going to sit in on, on meetings. So, so let's just unpack. because So shadowing an advisor, at this, at this time you were a lead advisor. Yeah. So you would um, have a meeting with one of your clients and, and um, uh, Chris would be in there ostensibly looking like he's taking file notes but learning. Would that be right? Exactly right. Taking notes and then we'll debrief what would you have said? What would you have done? Did that make sense? And then eventually over the next six months in his professional year, giving him the opportunity to take the lead where I'll sit back and not say too much and debrief afterwards. But what was very clear that we wanted to do is to give him the milestones to track that path every six months, every year, where he will be. So his personal plan. His personal plan to the extent that he knew once he graduated from the professional year program, what his remuneration would be, what we would do, um, the, the type of clients that he'll be servicing. So Chris is now, we have the total trust in him to look after every new client in our business, regardless of whether it's a $500,000 client or a $5 million client, I have total faith and trust in him being able to look after that particular client. And, and now that you've, you've, you've kind of beta tested that, because PY has only been around about as long as you've been in this program. It feels like three or four years is the PY. Um, so Matt Goddard is coming through. You're literally just rinse and repeat, going through what worked, doing the same things. And is, in many respects, is Chris helping you with, with, with Matt? Is that giving you some leverage? He, he is. So because we've, we've just done it for Chris, it's very fresh in everybody's mind. Um, what the milestones will be. And and for us, it's as a as a business leader in, in my business, it's so important for us to do what we would you know do do what we say we're gonna do. So we promise them that once that program ends and we're gonna hand over fifty or hundred clients, that's exactly what we're gonna do. Uh, when we tell them that we're gonna give them opportunities to be exposed to certain things, that's what we're gonna do. So so for us it's it's um yeah, just just giving them the opportunity, giving this generation of opportunity to shine. And we, when you kicked off, you obviously had many years um, within the Commonwealth Bank infrastructure. But these days, where do your new clients come from? Purely word of mouth, would you believe? So I'm um, I'm very old fashioned in the sense of uh, we we don't have a lot of social media exposure or LinkedIn or podcasts. This is my very first podcast that I've ever done. Hey, Kieran, hey, look at that. <laughs> so go easy on me. He's going pretty well, I would say. <laughs> yeah, I've got a thumbs up from Kieran, the sound guy. Yeah, so so for us, it's purely word of mouth, having very happy clients that want to share the good news with others. Um, we also have a mortgage broking business, so there are opportunities there that we could tap into. And we work with a couple of excellent accountants that just want their clients to be looked after. And you've looked, look, you've worked with those accounts for many years, yeah, like an yeah. unstructured format. Yeah, yeah. So some of the accounts that refer it could be about six or seven years, where initially it's just um, testing the waters with each other, building that trust, and now business is flowing. And this is all in that Parramatta, yes, ge- geography in Sydney. And for those people who um, aren't from Sydney. Um, uh, Parramatta is pretty well in the middle of this town of six million people. Um, it's the second city, so it's a um, it's the center of the world. It's okay, so we can we can edit that out, can't we? Is that is that? <laughs> <laughs> it's um now when we were chatting um previously, uh, you know, I often ask people, are there any questions you don't want me to ask? And you said, I don't think I've got a business coach. And uh, oh no, it wasn't that. You said, oh look, I'm not sure we do meeting rhythms. I said, well. How often do you meet? And you went, no, we do daily huddles. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, dude. Like there are people out there that meet once or two, twice a week or once or twice a month, but but you do daily huddles, right? And is it a, it is a non-negotiable discipline for you? I love it, by the way. It is. It so is. Tell me all about them and, and who's in them. What's the format? Does it include the global team? Go for it. Yeah. Everybody's in on the team huddle. What time of the day? Uh, it's nine o'clock. Every day, and unfortunately, even when it's daylight saving, so it's it's pretty bright and early for our team in Cebu, but everybody's in at, at nine. Yep, on Microsoft Teams or something like that. Or- on Microsoft yep. Teams, and we share the screen. We yep. go through Zeppo. Yep. And we look at all of our projects. Great. We look at what the priorities are for that day. We look at who's doing what. Yep. Um, so do and- people 
feel accountable at the end of their daily huddle? They they do, they do, because what we what we see is even before we huddle, all their notes and where each file is up to is already updated. Beautiful. So we we know that um, by doing it in the morning, it's consistent. It's every single day. Everyone, everybody comes prepared. So the huddle shouldn't take more than fifteen minutes. And who leads the huddle? Uh, Chris has been leading the huddle, so he's really taken on him, on to himself uh, to run through that meeting, and he does it a lot more efficiently than me. Um, and not only does Chris lead that morning huddle, but he's also leading our monthly meetings. So the monthly meetings is another key aspect of what we do for all of our teams. So all of our global team are involved as well. But it's not just talking about improvements, but it's also talking about why what we do matters, why it's important. And it is important because what we do can change someone's retirement for 30 years. So that's how important it is. But we can see that as leaders, the end-to-end process, but some of our back office and admin staff, where they're doing the repetitive tasks, they may not see that. So we want to be able to share those success stories with them. We want to go through some case studies over the last month, maybe two or three clients that we've made a difference for, um, times that we, because of the advice, because of the strategy, we've saved them money or we've saved them tax or put them into a better position. We've helped to apply for Centrelink that they didn't know that they were eligible for. So it's all these little things that that we see and we want our, our global team to understand the why, not just to do what we're asking them to do, but to understand why we're asking them to do it. So those monthly meetings are extremely helpful. And to uh, quote one of your clients, my financial planner, Mark Chan, and his great team are the most professional, courteous, and knowledgeable. They have greatly assisted me in into a transitional retirement with no loss of capital or investment in the most grueling of financial times. I greatly appreciate the hard work. So I suppose that's what it's all about, isn't it? It, it is, and it's so satisfying. Yeah, and have you managed to convey that feeling of achievement to all of your team via the the, the daily huddles and the monthly meetings and celebrating those little one percenters? Yeah, yeah. Look, we, we do. And it's important to to celebrate those wins. Um, and I think sometimes because we're so busy, we get lost in what we're doing without taking a step back to see how important are the little things that we do are important. What's a couple of little things that you or your practice does that you think clients value disproportionately over what they are look i think we've got we've got you know, it's, it sounds like the the most littlest of things but some of our merchandise clients love like what uh we have branded pens and we put them into the folders and their comment to us is oh we're still using the pen from last year would you believe well that's a, that's also just a sign <laughs> of affection as well isn't it really yeah. you know so, so it can be little things like that yep but it can be um, we give them umbrellas, we give them picnic rugs. But really the little things that I instill in, in my team to do is just to do what we say we're going to do with clients. This sounds so simple and easy and little, but if we promise a client that we're going to call them back that day, we do. And, and there's a culture of accountability in the business. Culture of accountability, but it goes both ways. For us, the culture of accountability and the little things that matter is not just for the clients, but even for our team. So what I mean by that is there was a situation a couple of weeks back where we were a little bit late in assisting a client with the withdrawal and the unit price moved barely. It was maybe an, uh, the detriment was $11 to the client. The client would never have noticed. The client didn't put their hand up to complain. We knew about it. And we made things right. So we, we refunded that to the clients and raised the issue with our licensee. Because I want to set that expectation that little things do matter. Because if we're not trustworthy, if we're not displaying integrity of the little things in our business, we can't possibly be doing it in the big things. And well, you, you are the standard that you walk past, right? So um, um, absolutely. And in the last couple of years building engine, what have been some of the rabbit holes you went down that have been sort of life lessons rather than successes? Um, look, look, a few a few things could be around the way that we initially went down outsourcing and, and it didn't always work. We've landed on a really good solution now. So what, but I want to learn from, from, from a few of those sort of honest 
truth. So, so what were the things that you might have done by omission or just didn't know that you've you've remedied and now it's awesome? Yeah. I think one of the the big ones um, earlier on is around the power planning and not including them as part of our team, but seeing them as being people that just do work for us and we just provide instructions and away they go and then we receive things back. So they weren't really integrated as part of what we do day to day. They didn't understand the why. So they cared about you as much as it perceivably you cared about them, which was just going through the motions. Yeah. That probably human nature is that they're less likely to give discretionary effort. So so um, bringing them in and, and treating them as part of the team was, is one of them. And that was, you know, the, the very nature of power planning can be confronting because it is, it's unitized, right? It's like how many of these type of plans can people do? And, and historically with outsourcing, it's been a pay per plan and there are some great contractors out there who do that, but they commoditize themselves. So, um, you know, it's very much business, business, you know, if I'm paying a thousand dollars or $2,000, I don't really have time for small talk, but that's where you're wrong, right? Because if you mm-hmm. want to grow that relationship, yeah. it's got to work. So I think I mentioned earlier when I saw um, your office, I said, do you own that? And you said, yes. And I said, well, there's your retirement plan, big guy. So, so um, if anyone can afford to buy their office um, um, in, a, in a high growth area, then um, that might be another tip. Would you agree? Oh, for sure. Um, wh- what I also like to ask is um, why do people join you? Why do they stay and how do they grow? Now, you've kind of answered a few of those things around um, by highlighting how you do those personal plans, by highlighting your intention of bringing people through their PY, mm. but there will there ever be a day where you'll be more comfortable now that you've got your back office perceivably humming of bringing in a more of a mature business writer or maybe an existing practitioner who's great advisor, maybe subscale back office? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Look, I think why why people stay with us is because they see us as being family. So when I say family and that family office is a really cliche, but when I talk about family, we're involving our staff's family in our gatherings. So when we have conferences, it could be interstate conferences, we're inviting their spouses. When we catch up and celebrate wins and have um, lunches in the office or we go out together, we're inviting their partners, we're inviting their families along as well to celebrate together. Tell me you still do the dishes? Um. <laughs> or, or is that, that that's mental scarring? <laughs> you, you go to his office, there's 10 dishwashers. <laughs> Yeah, but but I would say, uh, Roxy, that in terms of the next move for us, it's really wanting to to make an offering to solo advisors who are running their own race, running the business all on their own. We know it's a lonely journey. We know that it's sometimes unsustainable. It's unenjoyable. There's a lot of pain points. So the vision that we have for our future is that we really want to see advisors advise. We want them to spend 90% of their time doing what they're good at, doing what clients actually value. Because oftentimes clients don't value what they don't see. So the more we can put clients um, in front of the advisors to see what they're doing, to get that value, the more we win, the more that we succeed. So that's probably what we what we want to do. The, core, the, the the really for us, it's we want to build a business where we're attracting advisors who can leave all of their pain points behind to not not get bogged down by the admin, not get bogged down by things that don't add value. So we're trying to create that for our next generation of advisors, but also for established advisors who are running the race on their own find that there's so many things that they need to know that they're losing the love of the profession, we would love to have a chat with them. And I must say, and I was just, um, I asked Kieran just then how many minutes we've been going and it's 40-something and you have ne- you haven't referred once to I, everything's we. I don't know if you're aware of that subconsciously, but whenever you refer to what your business is doing, it's always we're doing this, we're doing that. So, um, you know, quite often people can dress up at an interview and can, can pretend to 
to involve the team and whatnot, but whether you realize or not, um, that's, that's how you refer and every single question. So well done. No, th- thank you, Roxy. And, and that's the reality is that, um, well, for I, I can't do this <laughs> yeah, without you struggle to actually say it. <laughs> yeah, without a village of people to help. Like even within the licensee community that I'm in with Fortnum, there's so many advice practices that have helped in my journey to help me be better. I'll give them a shout out if you if if, if you've got a few of them out there. Yeah, for sure. So so James Marshall, thank you, Andy Fenton, uh, Patricia Garcia. So these are the people that you now these people are so open and willing to share their secret recipe of what makes them great. These are businesses that I aspire to be part of, uh, to be be just like. Um, But they're so willing to tell us their secret sauce, their 11 herbs and spices, and you wouldn't expect that. But they've given so much time. And not only that, they are very detailed in their responses, genuinely wanting to help. They don't get anything back in return, oftentimes, because... I'm not at that same level of business that I can help them, but still they're very gracious and continually look at ways to help, to help. And, and that's not just the three people I've mentioned, but it's the broad you know, um, Fortnum private wealth cohorts that we've seen that time and time again, people just willing to help when you least expect. And um, it's a really good culture there. And I've spoken with a couple of um, Fortnum and, and previously Australian unity um, uh, practices and, um, uh, and what's your thoughts about the new co? What what the vision of of the new co is entirety? Look, we're pretty excited because look, there's there's more people in head office, there's more people that you can bounce off ideas of, um, and they've got a, a pretty robust team when it comes to compliance and and research and all the things that matter to us. Um, they're they're filling all the gaps. We were chatting earlier about, um, you know, I quite often ask uh, about you personally. I quite often ask about what drives you. And one of the questions are, you know, charitable programs. And, and you said, look, um, I don't know if this counts, but I've actually volunteered for X number of years um, for, for, for charity. So maybe it'd be great to hear kind of what floats your boat and what, what were the charities that you have given your time and what, what is it that you did with them? Yeah, so... Look, I, I have a particular like to help not-for-profit organizations, in particular religious organizations. So um, I um, am a Christian, so that means that what I want to do is to help um, Christian organizations who may need governance, who might need that financial acumen um, to help them get on their feet, to help them run a sustainable business model. So um, over the past few years, I have been quite involved in, in um, ministries that – I guess um, youth, and um, you know, having three teenage daughters myself, uh, maybe it's a little bit of self interest, but that's been been um, something that I I really enjoy getting my hands into. Well, you can't control your own children, but if you can control everyone around them, <laughs> is that your theory? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, that, I'm sure that um, uh, given that that um, the, the male representation in your family, you must be very good at convincing swing voters when you make a family decision. Working on it. <laughs> Working on it, a classic. Now, you, you've you articulated, um, you know, the vision that you've got. And, you know, we mentioned, we mentioned you know, the, the long-term relationship you've had with Adelaide. Adelaide's also um, helped, is, is, is running your power planning as well. When we sought out to do these engine room podcasts, I wanted to not only talk about people's, what they're actually doing today, but ask them questions around where they see different types of business models in financial planning. Now, the last 10 minutes, you've fundamentally articulated one of the big problems, which is um, one the small operators that are subscale. Um, and subscale to be able to deliver the, the, the back office that, that they, you know, that they're interested in. And, but you also mentioned that you, you've got a mortgage broking business, you, you work with accountants, you've You've um, uh, you refer out for for financial planning. It's for um, sorry, estate planning. Those kind of things. Um, do you see the business model for financial planning practices getting bigger, or do you see them getting more specialised, or both? I think both. I think that it's going to be very difficult for subscale practices to compete and to service clients well. I think in this day and age. Um, you know, it's it's 
fair that clients want more and to be able to, to, to deliver the services um, that justifies the costs, you need to run a very professional practice where there's specializations. So for us, we've made sure that we have those specializations that um, each admin person focuses on a particular area. It could be implementation, it could be on reviews, it could be on the power planning, but all of those things are important to build scale. And you referenced earlier that sometimes that's why you do those monthly meetings so that you give someone who's head down doing their particular execution, you give them context as to the efforts that they did, the results to the client. So that'd be fair to say. Yeah. Um, and uh, in relation to you know the very beginning of this podcast, you mentioned that you went private equity round table and they, uh, they said, oh, well, you know, because you generate all the business, um, you haven't got a business. Yeah. You're still looking after clients as we speak. Do you see the future of your practice? You always looking after clients? Do you see yourself performing a more of an executive non-client facing role? And over how many years do you think more years you'll need to get to that point where you can go back figuratively to that first conversation and go, there you go, you buggers. I now have a business. <laughs> Well, I'm still enjoying what I'm doing. In fact, over the last five years, I've been more motivated. I've been more driven to create this sustainable business. So, But I still love seeing the clients. That's what really gets me out of bed in the morning and gets me excited. And seeing clients that I've looked after for 15, 20 years and just seeing them journey through retirement and seeing their travels and seeing where they, what the kids are doing and the grandkids are doing, I'm still really enjoying that. I'm not ready to give that up just yet, but I think there will be a time that I'm stepping away, allowing the new generation of advisors in our practice that we're, we're fostering to possibly take on more of that client work and for me to focus on, on working on the business rather than in the business. And if I'm a person out there listening and I go, well, um, I share the same values, I love what you've done in the back office, um, you seem to have nailed the the global team, um, you're physically located in the Parramatta area, a large majority of your clients come into your office, so which is a bit of a departure from post-COVID. Um, and that's obviously one of your value propositions is that that solid security must come back to the old CVA days, you know, like they're coming into that physical bricks and mortar, solid and security. Yeah, if you build it, like, they will come. That's it. That's it. <laughs> so, um, well, you built it a hundred and something years ago or whatever. When Avondale caught it. Avondale, what was the name of it again? Avondale Wealth, A but, but, but the, it's Avondale House. Avondale House. Um, if I'm in that, in that area, um, uh, would you be open to an approach? If Ab absolutely. So, look, drop in for a coffee anytime. Because um, I think at the end of the day, it's it's good just to bounce off ideas of each other. We're always learning from other people, so it's never a waste of time. Yeah, no worries. And with, with that, I'd love you, I'd, thank you very much for your candor today, Mark. Thanks very much for sharing your story. Um, I actually will get out to Parramatta myself, I, you know, I, um, and check out your office. I'll take you up one of those coffees. Um, and you're you're another example of another business model that is successfully navigating the 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 new world of financial advice with your eye critically and absolutely on the client and the client experience. So on behalf of Ensemble in the Engine Room, thank you very much for unpacking your business today. Thank you, Roxy. It's been a lot of fun today.